Chapter 11, Home Again, Home Again. I decided to leave without any other goodbyes. I felt confident that Mommy would make up a story to tell Mel Jensen and the others. Lying came as naturally as breathing to her now. Maybe it always had. I took a cab to the airport and arranged to fly what they called the Red Eye from Los Angeles to Boston. For a while, I flirted with the idea of returning to New York to visit Holly and Billy, but the summer was drawing to a rapid end. I still had my last year of high school to complete, and I was tired of throwing myself into other people's lives. It was time to grow up, anyway, I told myself, to put my childhood beliefs back into my box of fantasies and close the lid forever on my past and my hope of having a real mother and a real father. I was truly an orphan. The only man who ever wanted to be my father was dead and the man who really was my father had kept it a secret and was happy that he escaped the responsibility. In a real sense, my mother had died twice. First, when she and Richard Marlin had invented their deception and sent a dead stranger back to my mother's coffin. And now, when I found her and failed to revive my real mother, daughter feelings in her. She was truly a stranger to me. I shed no tears walking away from her, and I could hear her sigh of relief as she closed the door behind me. Her ordeal was over. She could go back to living the life and the lie she always wanted. On the flight back to Boston, there wasn't anyone in the seat beside me on the plane. And for that, I was grateful. I was in no mood to make conversation. And after my near tragic experience with that man in New York who had tricked me into taking his drug-laden briefcase, I was weary of strangers anyway. I simply closed my eyes and welcomed the drowsiness. I slept for most of the trip. When I arrived in Boston, I made my way to the bus stop and bought a ticket to Providence Town. It was late in the morning by the time the bus headed out on the highway. I didn't leave enough time to get breakfast, but I had little appetite anyway. I felt numb, beaten, and drained of any resistance of energy. The monsters in the shadows were too big, too powerful, and there were far too many. It was better to retreat than to accept what had been my fate that seemed determined to have me. With that darkness well entrenched in my heart, I thought it was best to take a taxi to Grandma Olivia and Grandpa Samuels as soon as I arrived in Providence Town. Grandma Olivia was the true monarch of this family. She seemed to be the only one capable of determining destiny. She was the one who had decided how my grandma Belinda would live and where she would live. She was the one who ruled Uncle Jacob and Aunt Sarah's family. She even dominated Judge Childs. Certainly she was the one who ruled down on her own house and despite what my mother believed, Grandma Olivia was the one who banished mommy to poor, harder life in the coal mining town of West Virginia. It was time to recognize that power and bend to it. I had no more defiance in me. I felt like a flag at half mast. When the taxi pulled up in the driveway, Grandma Olivia's house, my sense defeat thickened. I moved lethargically, exhausted, my head down and up the walkway to the house, pressed the buzzer, resembling someone who had come to offer her surrender. Above me, the late afternoon sky turned into a deep, dark blue. The air smelled fresh, crisp, but I was too nervous to enjoy the beautiful day. Grandma Olivia's maid, Loretta, opened the door and stood looking at me, her face wearing a mask of indifference. I imagined working for Grandma Olivia had toughened her. She moved through her day like some cog in a machine, reliable, consistent, but uncaring. She revealed no reaction to my appearance. I could have been traveling salesman for all she cared. Will you please tell my grandmother that I'm here, Loretta? I said in a tired voice and stepped into the house. She lifted her eyebrows and gazed at my suitcases. 
She doesn't have to tell me I heard, and I turned to see Grandma Olivia at the top of the stairway. gazing down at us with her regal posture. She wore clothes of mourning. A black blouse and a black ankle length skirt which someone had made her look taller than she was. Her white hair was brushed and pinned back as usual, and there wasn't a trace of any makeup on her pallid face. That will be all, Loretta. She continued as she took a step down. You can return to your dinner preparations. Yes, ma'am, Loretta said with a slight curtsy. She hurried away. So you've returned as I knew you would. Giving you that traveling money was a waste, but it's your waste, not mine, she added. I will keep the document you signed and deduct it from your final trust fund. She continued her descent, sliding her hand along the mahogany balustrade as she walked, her head high, her shoulders back and perfectly straight. I don't have to ask you what happened. I can see it on your face. Disappointment. Disillusionment. Or should I say a final awakening? At last, you see her for what she is. She asked, not hiding her pleasure. It's because of the man she's with, I began. Oh, don't blame it on someone else, she interrupted with a wave of her hand. It was always that way with Haley. Someone was certainly, eternally, making excuses for her. Finding someone or someone else to place the blame and the responsibility for her selfish, cruel acts. She paused and smirked. I assume she faked her death in order to even, in order to end even a semblance of responsibility for you, she said smugly. Her eyes were unflinching. She had the confidence of a predator who knew she had her prey trapped. Yes, I murmured, my own eyes down. Even now, even after all I'd been through, I still couldn't help but being ashamed of Mommy. Huh, Grandma Olivia said. I looked up at her, tears burning under my eyelids, but kept trapped there. The last vestige of my pride. She shifted her eyes away from me, but when her gaze returned to my face, I thought I detected a hint of sympathy. Well, she continued, I suppose it's something you had to do, something you had to see for yourself. You can provide the details at some later time if you like. I certainly have no burning desire to hear them. But, she continued with that characteristic strength I hated, respected, and even envied at the same time. That part of your life is over and we must go on. This family must continue to strive to maintain its position of respect in the community. It would be best, obviously, if no one hears of this scandal. As far as I'm concerned, we buried your mother. I'm not gonna go dig up some unfortunate soul. Haley's as much dead to me anyhow, and from the looks of you, you feel the same. Who have you told about all this? Just Carrie, I said. 
Kenneth Childs will know too, she thought a moment. Kenneth will keep it to himself. I'll have a word with Carrie to ensure he does the same, she said with a curt little nod of her head. You don't have to worry, Carrie doesn't gossip, especially about our family, I said. And she smiled, but a cold, hard smile that turned her eyes to stone and glittering glass. Our family it is, that's good. That's what I want you to hear. She nodded, her smile softening just a bit. You did right coming here, she said. You have good sense. As we discussed before, you went on this futile journey. You'll have to live here from now on. She paused, her face hardening again. You know I'm sure about my son's passing while you were away. Yes, I said, I'm sorry. So am I. But we bury the dead so the living can continue to strive. Jacob was a good man, but he was a sufferer. He took things way too much to heart, and his heart was so weighed down it collapsed. There's a lesson to be learned, she said, widening her eyes at me. You have to build a casing around your heart to protect it. You don't give away your affections, your sympathies, your feelings cheaply, because every time you do, it costs you. There are many lessons you'll learn here, she said, continuing to fix her gaze on me so intently I dared not look away. As I told you before you left, you have, I have noted, demonstrated some of the qualities of character that although in the rawest form now, can be cultivated so that you will grow into a stronger person, a capable person. But this will happen only if you listen and obey. I don't intend to relive the painful past I endured with your mother, she warned. You will behave while you're under this roof and you will do nothing that will bring just discredit to this family. May this, maybe this isn't such a good idea, I suggested. Maybe I should go back and live with Aunt Sarah. And learn what? Self-pity? Huh. Besides, she has enough to do caring for her handicapped child. I can help her. I can waste your life, she concluded. Her cold eyes softened a bit. Everyone expects I'll look after you now that your mother is supposedly dead anyway. How do you think it will look if I permit Sarah to endure another burden immediately after losing Jacob? So you're worried about your own reputation, I said. She stiffened so quickly, it was as if an electric shock had passed through her. I was hoping you would see that I'm offering you an opportunity other girls your age would die to have. Yes, I have selfish motives, but they're not motives for myself. They're for this family. Family name, honor, reputation. These are really important things, Melanie. You'll learn that and understand it after a while. People without family pride are weak, and their weakness and lack of control affects the entire family. Look at women you insist, look at the woman you insist on calling mother. Does she have any pride in herself? Well, does she? She demanded. No, I admitted hesitantly. Do you want to be like her? She pursued. I raised my eyes and she smiled after one glance of fire in them. She Then she nodded. There's more of my family blood in you than you care to recognize, she said. Very well. You take the room that once belonged to Haley. I've had it prepared for you anticipating this day. Even though you've come to live here, you are to look after yourself and your own things. Loretta is my maid and will not have time to wait on you hand and foot. Besides, that's how we went wrong with Haley. We gave her too much, we spoiled her. Actually, Samuel was the one who indulged her and you know the thanks he got for that. I expect you to continue to do well in school. I also expect, no, demand, that you conduct your social and personal affairs only on the highest levels. 
Never do I want to hear even a hint that you've been doing some terrible things young people your age do these days. No drinking, no drugs, no promiscuity. And you're not to parade around this house in grotesque clothes that young people wear today that call them fashionable. I'll arrange for you at a preparatory school after high school graduation so that there'll be a smooth transition for you to complete your last year, she said in a calmer tone. However, as I said, there are things you'll learn from me just by living here and observing, things you can't learn in any school. You can go up and rest now. You look tired. If you want supper, come downstairs in two hours. Where's Grandpa Samuel, I asked. He's asleep on the lounge in the back. That's how he spends most of his time these days. Her voice was low as if she forgot I was in the room. Then suddenly she noticed me staring at her. Well, is something wrong? I'm not sure which room is my mother's, I said quickly, gazing up the stairway. First door on the left, she said. It's been cleaned and so has the bathroom. Make sure it remains that way. You'll find some clothes in the closet and the dresser drawers to wear. I had them bought for you the day after you left, anticipating this day, she added triumphantly. I wish I had a crystal ball, I replied dear, dear, dryly. You will, she said with confidence. Then she looked at me as if she were deciding whether or not to say welcome home. She remained silent, nodded, and then turned and went down the hallway to her parlor. Feeling like someone who'd been given a key to a motel room and told to find her way herself, I started up the stairs. When I reached the first door on the left, I paused and took a deep breath and opened it. My new home, I thought, and I gazed inside the room. If there had been any trace of femininity in this room before, Grandma Olivia erased it. It looked almost Spartan, a room of a nunnery. The walls were paper dark brown, no pattern, and there were plain white curtains on the window. The bed was a simple one without a headboard and was covered with a beige blanket and a pillowcase. There was a small desk in the corner and it had a few pads and pens and paper. The only furniture was a plain dark pine wood dresser with six drawers and a nightstand of matching dark pine next to the bed. There was no vanity table, no mirror, other than the mirror above the sink in the bathroom. Of course, there was no phone in my room, no television, no radio. When I opened the closet, I found a half a dozen simple dresses, two ankle length skirts, and some color coordinated blouses. In the dresser drawers, I discovered under things, socks and a few wool sweaters for which I would be grateful when the weather turned colder. I opened my suitcase and took out my two expensive outfits Holly's sister had bought me and I hung them in the closet. They almost looked comical next to this simple, inexpensive, practical clothing. I put the matching shoes on the closet floor and completed my unpacking finding a place on the nightstand for the Chinese fan Billy Maxwell had bought me. I promised myself I wouldn't let too much time go by before calling him and Holly and thanking them both. My unpacking completed. I sat on the bed for a moment and stared through the opening of the curtains at the ocean in the distance. The blue sea looked inviting, peaceful, soothing. At least I had that view whenever I felt trouble which I imagine would be often in this house. Gazing around, I wondered what this room had been like when my mother lived here. Grandma Olivia must have gone through it with a fury of a hurricane and torn away anything that suggested my mother had lived here. It was a good-sized room. I could make out where some shelves had been on the far wall. On them, my mother probably had her dolls and stuffed animals. From the little Carrie had told me, I understood that Grandpa Samuel had spoiled her and bought her whatever her heart desired. I wondered if all that had been consigned to the basement along with those pictures Carrie once showed me. 
or if it had been given away or even buried or burned. Grandma Olivia was not incapable of doing something like that. I lay back on the bed. The trip had been exhausting, even though I slept on the plane and the bus. I realized I was feeling deep emotional fatigue, the kind of weariness that gripped my bones. Just dozing on the plane or bus wasn't enough to quench it. I was hungry, though. I thought I would just close my eyes and take a short rest, and then, as Grandma Olivia said, go down to dinner. But when I opened my eyes again, it was so dark I couldn't see the door. The sky had become overcast, shutting out the stars. I blinked, sat up, and listened. The house was quiet, barely creaking. I fumbled for the light switch and the small lamp by the bed and squinted when it came on. Then I looked at the clock. It read 2 a.m. I had not only slept through dinner, I slept through the night. A feeling of panic, like a little trickle of ice water, ran down my spine. I had intended to call Carrie right before or after dinner and let him know I was back. He would be upset if he wasn't the first one I called or seen. Now it would be hours before I'd be able to tell him I was back, and I wanted to get over to see Kenneth as soon as possible, too. There was so much to do here. I was sleeping at the vulnerable time anyway. After waking to such an alarm, of course, I couldn't fall back asleep. That famous jet lag everyone warned me about was taking its toll. My body didn't know what time it was, and my stomach was angry at being forgotten. It growled and churned. I rose and went to the door and peered out. I could see a faint light in the hallway over the stairway. The door creaked as I opened it further, then I practically tiptoed down the stairs each step on the staircase betraying me with a groan as I descended. I didn't want to disturb anyone, but I needed to eat something, some milk, a piece of bread, anything. On my way down the hallway toward the kitchen, I saw there was a light coming from the parlor. When I reached the doorway, I paused to gaze to see Grandpa Samuel slouched in an easy chair, his hands on his stomach, his mouth open as he slept. On the table beside him was a decanter of brandy and a partially filled goblet. I continued on to the kitchen where I made myself a turkey sandwich and I ate it quickly, feeling like a thief. Suddenly I heard a gasp and looked to the kitchen doorway to see Grandpa Samuel standing there looking as if the blood drained from his face. My God, he said, stumbling forward, his eyes wide. Haley? No, Grandpa, it's Melanie, I said. I'm sorry I woke you, but Melanie, he scrubbed his face with his palms and then looked at me again, a dazed look in his eyes. Melanie? Yes, Grandpa, I was hungry. I fell asleep and missed dinner and, oh, yes, yes. Olivia told me. She had Loretta look in on you, he shook his head. For a moment there, your mother used to come home late like this and go to the kitchen and gobble something. Lots of times she had too much to drink, he added in a whisper, but he wouldn't tell Olivia. I'd make sure that she got some food and I'd send her up to bed. Well now, he continues, still sounding a bit confused. I guess it's late. I should go up. Olivia's probably given up on me again. He looked at me. It was as if he still didn't trust me, trust reality. I didn't hear you come in, Haley, he said after a long moment. He shook his head. I'd better go to sleep. I'll lock the front door again. Olivia locked it when you didn't come home on time, and she said to let you sleep in the streets. But as usual, I unlocked it when she went upstairs. What? Grandpa, it's me, Melanie, I said softly, puzzled by his behavior. Maybe he was sleepwalking and talking. He smiled. Let it be another one of our secrets, okay? Now, don't you oversleep tomorrow morning, he warned, waving his right forefinger at me. Then he smiled. Good night. He turned and slowly made his way toward the stairs, looking more like an old man than ever. He shuffled away. I cleaned my dishes, wiped the table, 
and erased all the traces of my midnight snack. When I went to the stairway, however, Grandpa Samuel was just pulling himself up the final steps and groaning as he made his effort to Grandma Olivia's bedroom. I went up to my room quickly and closed the door. I got undressed and put on one of the new nightgowns that were in my dresser drawer and crawled into bed. Finally, my stomach was settled, but my mind raced as I tried to figure out Grandpa Samuel's strange behavior. I didn't look that much like my mother, did I? I wondered, and after I had told him who I was, he didn't, he seemed to remember. Why did he forget and talk to me again as if I were Haley, as if he were living 20 years in the past? There, you see, it's Melanie, our granddaughter. Melanie, not Haley, Grandma Olivia insisted when I entered the dining room to have breakfast the next morning. I was still lounging in bed when I heard the two of them walk by my room earlier that morning, and I scrambled to the shower and dressed as quickly as I could. Grandpa Samuel gazed from his bowl of oatmeal and nodded, smiling at me as I took my seat at the table. He was dressed in a sports jacket and wore a tie, but he had done a poor job shaving his face. There were patches of gray stubble on his chin and along his jaw. He was raving last night, Grandma Olivia continued, talking stupidly again, telling me Haley was back. <laughs> Good morning, Grandpa Samuel, I said, concerned that he'd given away my early morning wandering. His eyes looked glassy, distant, however. I gazed questioningly at Grandma Olivia. He's slipping away, she muttered, into his dotage. What's that, Olivia, he asked. What about the cottage? I didn't say anything about a cottage, you fool, she snapped. I want you to see a doctor about that hearing aid today. I told Raymond to take you over there. Oh, fine, fine. I got time today, he said, and she laughed. You hear that? He can find time in his busy schedule today. <laughs> I gazed at him. He was so different. And it had happened so quickly, I thought. I turned again to Grandma Olivia, who saw the confusion in my face. He's been like this ever since Jacob's death, she exclaimed. It hit him like a sledgehammer and aged him years and minutes. Grandpa Samuel blew on his spoonful of oatmeal and gazed absently ahead, looking through me. Oh, how sad, I said. As is much a life, Grandma Olivia instructed. That's why it's important to learn how to deal with unpleasantness, how to accept what you can't change and move on to what you can. Don't ever waste your time again on lost causes. Time is too precious. You're young now, so you think you're leave, you'll be living young forever, but one day you'll wake up and find yourself unable to count the wrinkles and gray hairs that you have and aching pains that you never had before. She turned back to Grandpa Samuel. If you keep blowing on that same spoonful, Samuel, it'll turn to ice. Eat it already. <laughs> What's that? Oh yes, I have time today. I have time, he muttered. I don't know why I bother, Grandma Olivia said. He'll soon be in the room next to my sister, you'll see. Maybe with time, I said. With time, he'll grow worse. There's no sense in wasting tears over it. What are your plans for today? Do you have everything you need to start school? I believe that's next week, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is, and I've got everything I need. I was hoping to go visit Carrie and Aunt Sarah in May, I said. That pathetic woman, all she does day and night is cry. Her eyes are so bloodshot, it's a wonder how she can still see out of them. I'm sure it's been very hard for all of them, I said, remembering how awful I felt when my stepdaddy Chester died. Jacob's, uh, Jacob has a good insurance policy. There's adequate money for the way they live, and I made sure that he had a little more. They won't starve or go out without necessities, she said. 
I'm talking about more than money, I said, amazed that she could show no emotion when she talked about the death of her own son. She laughed as if I had said something hilarious. Yes, when you find out what it is, let me know. I already know it's love, concern, friendship. No one loves anyone more than he or she loves him or herself. You'll discover that. I hope not, I said. You already have, she replied. What could be more intense than a mother's love for her own child? And yet your mother loves herself more. Don't think romantic love is any different. Men and women crave each other, pledge all sorts of things to each other when they're young and in love. And then time goes by and they begin to grow apart. Their own interests become more important again. Before you know it, she said, gazing at Grandpa Samuel, who was blowing on another spoonful of oatmeal. Thirty-five years has gone by, and you hardly know the man who shares your bed. And if he doesn't end up calling you by some other name, you're fortunate. Don't place too much faith in romantic love, Melanie. What do you believe in, Grandma Olivia? I told you. Family, name, reputation, self-respect. She dabbed her lips with a napkin and rose. For today, and only today, I will permit Raymond to cart you over to Sarah's before he takes Samuel to the ear doctor. But don't, I don't intend to have him do that for you every time you get it in your head to go somewhere. Samuel, she snapped, do you intend to play with your food all morning? What? Oh, is it time to go? It was time to go a long time ago, she said wistfully. The sadness in her voice caught my ear and I stared at her for a moment. She quickly realized I was looking at her and rose from the table. Finish your breakfast, Melanie. I'll have Raymond wait for you in the drive. As soon as I finished my breakfast, I joined Grandpa Samuel in the car. When Raymond brought me to Aunt Sarah's, I expected Carrie would have already left to go to the lobster boat. But when I got out of the car and knocked on the door, it was he who opened it and gazed out at me, his eyes first full of surprise and then full of joy. Melanie, you're back. Hello, Carrie, I said, smiling. He started towards me to embrace me, then saw Grandma Olivia's car pulling away. What's Raymond doing here? Where are your suitcases? How long have you been back in Providence Town, he asked, firing his questions. I got in yesterday, but I was so tired from the trip I fell asleep as soon as I put my head on the pillow and slept into the night, I said. Slept, slept where? You went to Grandma Olivia's house first? Why? Where are Aunt Sarah and May, I asked instead of replying. Inside, what's going on? Why did you go to Grandma Olivia's first? You're going to stay with her after all, aren't you? He demanded. Yes, Carrie, I am. Why? You remember we had this discussion before I left and I learned Judge Childs was my real grandfather and Kenneth was my uncle. Yes, but none of that's changed, Carrie. And with my mother really not dead and buried, but no one knows it. And with dad gone, that's just it. I just think it's best for now. Your mother has enough to do, especially with everyone believing my mother's dead and buried. Grandma Olivia thinks it's better for all concerned. But just as I promised before I left, I'll see you every day, I added quickly. His green eyes seemed to pierce right through me as his lips curved up into a disdainful smile. I didn't think you'd go through with it after your trip to California. But I guess now you've tasted wealth and glamour and you'd rather live in the mansion, right? No, that's not it, I protested, shaking my head. There's no question she can do far more than what we can, he continued, folding his arms across his chest and pulling his shoulders back. I don't blame you. Stop talking to me like that, Carrie. You don't understand. Oh, I understand. That's my trouble. I understand too much, he said. This time I permitted the burning tears to course down my face. Visiting my mother was a disaster. First her boyfriend Archie or Richard Marlin or whoever he is tried to get me into a pornographic movie and mommy approved, I said. 
Carrie's cold smirk evaporated a bit. Then he tried to, tried to rape me, and she believed him when he said it was my fault. She was happy to see me go. She has everyone believing that she's not much older than I am. She told them I was her sister and I had to pretend to be her sister. I have no parents anymore. No one who truly cares about me, I cried. You have me, Melanie, and May and my mother. You know she needs someone to fill Laura's place in her heart. That's just it, Laura's place. I appreciate that, but I've gotta become myself and I'm afraid, Carrie. I'm afraid now more than ever, I confessed, hiding my eyes as I did so. Your mother will want me to be Laura. I'm sorry, I said. I wiped away more tears. He was silent. I know what you mean, but I just, you think I want to live with Grandma Olivia? She's cruel in ways I don't even understand, but she's strong, Carrie. And if ever there was a time I needed someone strong, it's now. I'm strong, he proclaimed. You are, but you have to be strong for your mother and your sister first, especially right now, I said. Later, when the time is right, I want you to be strong for me, too. That brought a warm smile to his face. He thought a moment and then he nodded and stepped closer to embrace me. I loved the feel of his strong arms around my body. I wish I could sink into them and be safe and secure behind the walls of his love forever and ever. He kissed away my lingering tear and brushed back my hair. I thought I lost you forever, he said. I thought you would fall in love with Hollywood. I hated it, Carrie, at least the part I saw. It's not the place for me or for my mother, but she just hasn't realized it yet. I'm afraid that when she finally understands, it will destroy her. Grandma Olivia's right, Melanie. You need to forget about Haley. You've come home to us. You need to start thinking about the future. He looked up at me sheepishly. I never thought I'd agree with her about anything. I know, I hate to say this, but I think we both have a lot to learn from her. He laughed and then grew serious. You saw how bad Grandpa Samuel is, I suppose. Yes. It's as if something snapped in his head when your father died. Carrie nodded and the tears glistened in his eyes. He swallowed quickly and then smiled again. Well, May will be happy to see you and so will Ma. Come in, he said and stepped aside. He kissed my cheek again and we entered the house. May was at Aunt Sarah's feet reading and Aunt Sarah was doing some needlework, her hands working mechanically, her mind obviously elsewhere. Aunt Sarah lifted her eyes slowly, and when she saw me, her face softened into the most loving and wonderful smile, the smile that I had wished to find in my own mother's face but didn't. Melanie! She put down her needlework, and action caught May's attention. The moment May saw me, her face exploded with happiness and she jumped and ran into my arms. <laughs> I held her tightly and she pulled back and began signing me with such speed. I couldn't keep up. Slow down, Carrie signed. She's so full of questions and she'll exhaust you quicker than any cross-country trip. I laughed and stepped forward to embrace Aunt Sarah. I'm so sorry, Aunt Sarah. I know, dear. He fought hard. The doctor said that he fought until the end. He didn't go out gentle into the good night. Not Dad, Carrie said proudly. He was a real Logan. For a moment, I thought about Grandma Olivia's words concerning family dignity, and I smiled at Carrie's pride. Come sit with me and tell me about your journey. Where are your suitcases? Has Carrie brought them upstairs already? She asked, looking from me to him. Carrie didn't say anything. I'm going to stay with Grandma Olivia for now, Aunt Sarah. With Grandpa Samuel the way he is and all, I think she wants my company, I explained. It wasn't such a terrible white lie, I thought. Actually, I hoped it was true. Oh, I see, she said, fighting hard to hide her disappointment. She forced a smile. Well, she can do so much for you. Of course you should stay with her. That's very good. So then, that woman wasn't Haley after all? I looked at Carrie, whose eyes told me 
He hadn't said a word to her. No, Aunt Sarah. The woman I found wasn't the mother I was hoping to find. Oh, how sad, she nodded with a small smile. But at least you're back here home with us. And we're family again. You must tell us about California. I've never been there. I sat beside her on the sofa and told her about my trip. May sat there at my feet watching my hands and Carrie sat at what has always been his father's chair listening and his eyes were fixed on me. We had lunch and then Carrie and I took May for a walk along the beach just as we used to do. While you were away, May and I came out here often. I pretended you were with us. It was easy because she can't hear so I could talk out loud to you. I don't know how many times I told you I loved you. I heard you each time, I said. He tightened his hold on my hand. Can you stay for dinner? I think I better go back for dinner. But I want to see Kenneth this afternoon and I was hoping you'd drive me out there, I said. He turned away quickly. What's wrong? I was out there yesterday, he said. Kenneth's different. I think all of it, finishing his big work, your friend's discovery of Haley, your leaving, all brought back painful memories. Memories he was able to bury in his work. What's wrong with him? He's drinking a lot, actually. I found him sleeping on the bench. You laces whining beside him. I helped him into the house. He obviously been out there all night. Oh no, Carrie. I don't know if you should go there. More than ever, Carrie. I should go there. More than ever, I said. I said it with such determination and strength I even surprised myself. With all your unhappiness and all your problems, you think you can go and help someone else, he challenged. Because of that, I replied, thinking about some of the things Grandma Olivia had said. It's important to learn how to deal with unpleasantness, how to accept what you can't change and move on to what you can. And you think you can change Kenneth's unhappiness? He asked with skepticism and amazement. Yes, I said, gazing out over the blue waves that rolled towards us. Yes, I do. 